unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. I started a sermon series when I was trying to express a few concerns of the reason why we don't see God in our dispensation as the people of old, why we don't see answers touching the miraculous power of God like the people we read of in the Bible. And I have been blessed, and I believe a few or a couple of ministers across the world have been blessed to see the tangible power of God, the lame walking, the blind seeing, the deaf hearing, the dumb speaking, the dead raised. We've seen miracles that even the doctors would call in and say, this is a miracle. We've had experiences where people were healed and even the doctors gave their lives to Christ. Okay, things that science cannot explain. I believe in miracles. I believe in the wonder-working power of God. But this is not a conversation that, you know, everybody or every church is putting on the table. Some have actually accepted that we'll never see miracles again. Miracles are not for our time. It was for that day or probably this can heal, this cannot heal. And so I started to take some time. Okay? And I remember I took my reading from Romans 1.20, I believe, where the Bible speaks of the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that men are without excuse. And as giving the impression and mind that we no longer have an excuse not to be, not to do the things that we were called to do. The Bible says we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus and two good works for which we are ordained, prepared, made ready for before time in memorial that we should walk in them, living that good life. God has called us to glory and virtue, not failure and suffering. God has called the church to be victorious and a triumphant one, but we're living in a time where people have not learned yet how to possess that great blessing that is already given from the time you receive him as your personal Lord and Savior. You have been given everything that pertains to life and godliness. You've been blessed with every spiritual blessing, the heavenly places in Christ. But why don't we see the power, the glory of God like we have read before or some people are experiencing somewhere in the world? I believe that the clock of history has positioned great purpose touching the ministry of signs, miracles, and wonders in this time more than ever before. And I believe that those of us who are listening and are alive to hear this, I believe that the words that I'm going to share with you are going to bless you immensely. Men are without excuse. We no longer have an excuse to do miracles. We no longer have an excuse to do signs because the Godhead has been revealed to us. All the things that must be understood, both of the things that are made and visible and of the things that are invisible, God has given that understanding in the fullness of the person, Jesus Christ. Now we are without excuse. Okay? We don't have an excuse to see the wonder-working power of God. And I believe that we're transitioning every other day in knowledge as a church progresses and I see that a time will come where we will see people holding meetings of 10, 20, 30, 40,000 and probably 5,000 or 3,000 of them are sick and all will be healed. We're seeing a time and we're getting close to a time where we'll see that. I remember when we were in the crusade we had in Gulu, when I told people to raise their hands of them that were healed, the people that were writing those testimonies could not write because the numbers were in the thousands upon thousands. But I believe that God is giving something to the church in this dispensation. I believe more than ever before that we're going to get to a point where all will be healed. All right? All will be healed. And this is not for special men of God. This is opposed to that prophet, that teacher, that evangelist. This is for every believer that proclaims the name of Christ. So the last I taught about the issues that the Christ went through in healing the sick. Today, I want to address you, the believer. All right? For those of you who have read church history, there was a time where we had a movement called the Word of Faith. All right? And the proponents of that movement were emphasizing healing through the word, okay? Because they believed, and I believe, that the word and the spirit agree. That what you can do by the spirit, you can do by the word. And what you can do by the word, you can do by the spirit. The word and the spirit agree with each other. 
all right? And yes, we have people who are gifted. For example, there are people, I believe, who have a gift of healing. They have a healing anointing on their lives, all right? But what if you don't have a healing anointing on your life? Are you supposed to seek a man with a healing anointing to be healed or you can by the word know how to heal or be healed? And this goes beyond our health. It goes into our financials. It goes into our relationships. It goes into every aspect that would require the activation of your faith, okay? Now, from about the late 50s into the 60s, 1960s, 70s, when the Word of Faith movement had really taken its roots, there was a challenge in that time because there were people who joined the movement and, of course, tremendous miracle signs and wonders evidently were there. It was undeniable that people received healing, people were delivered, people were set free, millions were healed, okay, in that movement. But there was a group of people that appeared to have grasped the concept of that movement had understood, appeared to have understood the doctrine of the movement, had applied themselves to faith, had done almost everything by the book, but they died, right? And we lost a couple of them, a number of them, a big number of them was lost as well in the time when people were receiving healing, okay? And so towards that time, the end of that move, of course, different doctrines had emerged because some people asked, why are some healed? Why aren't some healed? And there were no answers given. So some concluded that I think God heals some and he does not heal others. All right. And one great man in that movement, in fact, writes in one of his books that I believe that some are healed and some are not healed. But he was honest to say, but I do not know why, he said. He said, I do not know why. And that's okay if he says he doesn't know why. That means his heart was open to learn and hear from God. Of course, there are people who said some heal and some don't heal, and they gave reasons too. And reasons that I would not agree with because when I open the scriptures, nothing agrees with their doctrine. Nothing agrees with their conclusion, okay? Nothing agrees with their conclusion. And so I want to go back to what the word says in spite of what people conclude because we've had doctrines of, you know, uh, there are people God has made not to heal. There are people that were never meant to be healed, even though they are believers. And you ask yourself the question, so you mean God is a respecter of persons? You mean when you say that with God all things are possible, there's possibility with one man and impossibility with the other? You mean in God there is a shadow of turning within? No, the Bible says in God there is no shadow of turning within. In other words, his word is straight as is, it does not change, it is eternally placed and it will work as he has sent it out to work. The question was, why are some healed? Why are some not healed? And I cannot tell you the pain some of the families go through. A gentleman one time approached me and said, oh, I have a son who was believing in God and he did not, you know, take care of himself in faith and he lost his sight, okay? What knowledge, what teaching do you have to provide for such people, all right? And it's a hard thing when you think about it. It's a complicated thing to think about, but doesn't mean that because somebody lost their sight trying to believe God, it means that they really have a problem. It's only that they have not really been taught enough. They have not really come to the understanding of how faith works, okay? I don't fault men for trying or for attempting to believe God against all odds, all right? I have a problem when a man cannot believe God. That means the day you get an incurable disease, okay? You're gonna have to write your will and die, okay? Because the Bible is clear. The just shall live by faith. Okay? The day you stop believing is the day you start dying, even though no physical ailment is on you. All right? You cannot run away from faith if you are a believer. And yes, science can do its part. I thank God for the doctors who are an extending hand of healing, but doctors have an end to it. But as you continue practicing and exercising yourself, you will get and you can get to a place of divine health because I believe the calling of every believer is divine health, not just healing, but divine health, all right? And this cuts across into your finances, that you can get to a point where you are financially delivered, independent, and that you'll never be broke another day. It's possible for you to cross a certain ceiling in your relationship that you will never see sudden mayhem any other day. It's possible to live a free and victorious life in Christ. You read through scripture on every occasion. You read the Bible on every occasion. 
where men failed to heal the sick. And you always go back to Jesus. And these disciples are asking how or why could we not cast out these devils? And Jesus would tell them, because of your unbelief. Because of your unbelief. You saw Jesus complaining, oh, a perverse and an unbelieving generation, a defiled and an unbelieving generation. Jesus' problem with the church was always around their belief. It was never a miracle, a sign or a wonder that was denied any believer in scripture, except if that believer had not learned to walk in faith. Notwithstanding that we have experiences where certain prayers are not answered, not because God is not in the business of answering, but because they oppose epignosis, the complete and perfect knowledge of God. Because when we go in the complete and perfect knowledge of God, epignosis, we exercise ourselves and prove the things that are most excellent in the realm of the ethical and the divine. Okay? For example, you cannot say that it's ethical for you to look at another man's wife and say, by faith, I'm going to take over another man's wife. That's not ethical. It's not in the things ethical, and it's not in the things divine. We're not talking about the obvious prayers that are out of the course of truth. All right? That's what epignosis does. It opens your spirit to be acquainted to what is ethical and what is divine. Okay? Today, we see preachers who are reacting unethically, according to the order of God. They pervert the words of God and ensnare men by either misleading, misjudging, or misrepresenting the laws of the Spirit. Okay? It is because they have not been matured or perfected in the ways of epignosis. It is important for every believer to acquaint themselves with that dimension because when you understand the precise and perfect knowledge of God, you discern what is ethical. You pray in what is ethical okay, and what is divine. You know how to judge. Okay? It's the fulfillment of God's love. It abounds in knowledge and judgment that we might approve. The Bible says the things that are most excellent that we might not have offense on the day of Christ. The mature understand that. But we're talking about the things that you know are clear. Okay? For example, healing. You do not have any excuse not to be healed, to die sick. You don't have an excuse, biblically. You don't have an excuse to die poor. You don't have an excuse to have a failed relationship. You don't have an excuse. Unless it's your choice, okay? But there's no excuse. We are going to a place where we do not have excuse. You don't have an excuse not to be a success. There is no excuse. It was the time you did, but now Christ has been revealed fully to the church in whom I hid all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We don't have any excuse anymore not to see God. So you see Jesus in the Gospels and they cannot cast out devils. They cannot do certain things. And he's always about their unbelief. You know, things that were ethical, divine, godly, in line with God's will and purpose. There was never a reason why a child of God should not receive a miracle. Okay? So, we start to realize that the most fundamental, read through all the Gospels, it's faith. Ye of little faith. Ye and believing generation. Okay? So, like the days of the Word of Faith movement, where people died in their faith, failed in their faith, they believed for a financial breakthrough it did not come and some were even arrested for, you know, borrowing or investing in things they were not able to carry to the end. The reasons and ways are endless when it comes to people that have failed in this work of faith. Now, I want to show us why people fail in faith. Because remember, even in Hebrews, the Bible speaks of people which died in faith. They saw the promises, they observed them from afar, but they never obtained them. God has called you to live in faith and by faith, not to die in faith or by faith. You understand what I'm saying? We are called to a life of the fulfillment of the will of God on the earth in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay? We've been called to glory and virtue, and I'll repeat that. But I want to explain why. We had issues in the Word of Faith movement, still have issues in present day every time we are expressing the dispensation of faith. It is one thing 
to read the word and understand it and connecting to its life. And it's also another thing when you read the word, understand it in your mind, but cannot connect to its life. There are two kinds of people, all right? There are people who have learnt how to read the word and connect to the life in that word. And there are people who have just learnt to read that word, cram it and speak it. They just speak a word that they have no relationship with, all right? And I want to take you through a journey to help you understand how and what is the essence of this life in the word. The Bible has a very common scripture in Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20. He says, My son, attend my words, okay? Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life and to them that find them and health to all their flesh. These words are life unto them that find them and health to all their flesh. Okay? But the key word here is finding. Finding. These words are life to them that find them. Not just to them that read them. Not just to them that are read to all these words. Not just to them who have gone to Bible school. But their life to them that find them, okay? There's a place in the finding. And let me explain this place, okay? Now, the Hebrew word for finding, right, is mautzal. And mautzal means to have an encounter with them, all right? To have an encounter with them. And I'll explain that. The word of God is supposed to be an experience. You don't just read the word like you're reading newspapers or you're just reading a novel, okay? The Word of God is supposed to create an encounter of experience when you read it, okay? Remember, in the beginning was the Word, all right? And the Word was with God, and the same was in the beginning with God. And he says that nothing was made that is made, that was made without him, okay? Everything we see made was made with the Word. Understand this. In that Word was life. And the Bible says, and that life was the light of men. And that is the light that shines in darkness. The Bible says, and darkness comprehended it not. The light shines in darkness. He gives you the cause and effect that darkness is as a result simply of the absence of light. That when light comes, when something is lit, you don't need to rebuke darkness. In fact, the war now goes on the side of darkness, but it cannot even fight that light. That's why the word used there is comprehend it. It could not hold darkness, could not hold light. You cannot get a bright light and put it somewhere where it's dark, and darkness holds that light. It's not possible, okay? It's not possible. And remember, when we talk about darkness, right? Darkness is the direct meaning of ignorance. Like is light the direct meaning of knowledge, okay? Where darkness is, you just need to light. That's all. Think about it very keenly. Get it from your head and take it to your spirit and understand this. That where darkness is, you just need to simply place light. And once light comes in a place, there is no effort that is required of light to establish itself, okay? Where darkness is when it's lit, when it's given the illumination. And likewise, darkness is defenseless. It cannot even attempt. It has no chance, all right? In fact, the word mautza also translates to mean to understand the sufficiency of the word. Okay? But you can only understand its sufficiency through having an experience, an encounter with the Word. To have an experience of encounter with the Word. Not just meeting it, but to have a place of relationship with the Word. In fact, the other word as well defining Mount Tsao is light upon. All right? Now let me explain this. I've already told you that the spirit realm is veiled. All right? When a light comes onto these things, 
whatever is lit on in the spirit is unveiled. Okay? And I have shared before once that there are two kinds of lights spiritually for the believer. The first light is the light that hits your eyes to see the things that you must see. But the second light is the light that is hit on the things that you must see. It's one thing for a blind man, all right, to be in a room and light is everywhere and it is lighting on things, but that blind man cannot see, all right? When you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your eyes are open to a certain reality, to a certain realm, to a certain eon, to a certain age, to a certain dispensation, all right? Because you've been translated from darkness to light. The life of salvation is darkness to light. But this light really is for your eyes, okay? Now, when you sit under the teaching of the pastor, the prophet, the evangelist, the apostle, the teacher, wherever you're sitting, okay, we are meant to perfect you. Okay? for the work of ministry by the opening of your eyes, all right? That our work is simple, to make all men see, the Bible says, what is the fellowship of the mystery. In Ephesians, that the eyes of your understanding will be flooded with light, that you will know what is the hope of your calling, what are the glorious riches of inheritance of the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of power that is at work within us, the same that he wrote when he raised Christ from the dead. But to know, to know this, you cannot have a true knowledge when your eyes are not lit, all right? But also, there's a light that comes, and that light is meant to shine on the things you must see, all right? Your eyes are open, okay? But then you're in a room that is dark, okay? And then a light is sent, and that light is sent to open, to unveil whatever is hid, all right? Now, the relationship God wants to give you is that as your eyes are opening also, okay, the light that is shining on those things is clear. It's mouths out to light upon, all right, to connect to the things you must see. As your eyes are opening, the things that are veiled before you too must be opened. That's the reason why we have mysteries, revelation, revelation is the place that unveils and opens these things. That light comes and hits it. And God said that once that light is hit on those things that are veiled, then you have an opportunity. A door is open to you. A window of the Spirit is open to you to understand. Okay? And I want you to follow that. So, my son, he says, incline your ears. Open your eyes to these words. He says, for they are life to them that have an encounter of experience with them and can prove their sufficiency to them that can see the light that is hit on the things of the Spirit, okay? The reason why the people who are on the way of faith die in this faith, fail to have the results of this faith is because they have failed to connect to the life in the Word. And God is telling you that these words are life to them that find them. You cannot have this life without the finding. You cannot have this life without having an encounter of experience with the word. You cannot have life without a light that has been hit on the things that are veiled in the spirit, but also has allowed your eyes to be lit to see, all right? He says, when you have life with this word, the Bible says you'll have health in all your body. Okay? But not only just the body, everything else that surrounds you will have life. And that's the time I just want to help people understand how to connect to the life in the Word. Remember, firstly, let us look at the Word that brings salvation. Let me first break it into two. If you will open with me in uh, John chapter 5, verses 24, the Bible says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, the Bible says that person hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Okay? There is a word, firstly, that is sent for your salvation, to give you eternal life. We need to see that. To give you eternal life. All right? And God says that there is no condemnation on a person who receives eternal life because he has passed from death to life. Right? When we are on crusade grounds or when you are speaking to somebody who is not born again, you are witnessing to somebody who is not born again, you're giving them the word of salvation. It's called the word of salvation. 
right? And then you convince them as God works into their spirits as you're teaching them, and that person receives Jesus as his Lord and Savior. That's called the word of salvation. It is the same emphasis that John gives when he says that that which was from the beginning, First John chapter 1, verses 1, he says that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the word of life, He's expressing a place where we give men, we have experienced it, okay? And he says, and we pray that your fellowship is with us, for our fellowship is with the Father. John is talking to people who have not yet built a relationship with God, okay? And he's calling them into this fellowship by the word of life, okay? So we're talking about the word of life or the word of salvation. When you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and say, I'm born again, you've received the word of life or the word of salvation, Okay? You've received eternal life. That means you will not die. You have an inheritance. Okay, You are going to heaven. Now, the word that gives you salvation, the word of life that grants you salvation, Okay, if you stay on that, if you just say, now I've received Jesus as my Lord and Savior, it's not enough to help you live the Christian life. It's not enough to help you walk the life of faith. It's just enough to give you eternal life. And there are people who have eternal life within them, but they're going to die of diseases that are incurable by man. They have eternal life within them, but they're going to die broke. They have eternal life within them, but their relationships are going to fail. They have eternal life through them, but they will never express the splendor, the glory of the resurrected Christ. So it's not just enough to say, I'm born again. There are many people who are born again, but they're dying and are failing in life. They're failing. Everything around them is out of order. In fact, some people look at you and they're like, hmm, are you born again? If you're born again, why are you failing? All right. Some of you, some people listening, when they look at you, there's nothing on you that proves that actually Jesus was raised from the dead. Okay. Because yes, you have the word of salvation, the word of of life to have salvation. You're born again, you are guaranteed of heaven, okay? You are guaranteed of the life after. But what is gonna happen, or what is happening right now before you die? What are you gonna be doing before Jesus comes for you? All right? If somebody's just gonna die the next two seconds and they receive that word of salvation, well, death to life, they go to heaven. But for you and I who is alive and you still have a number of years, to do great exploits and see God mightily work through you. You transition and then you start to connect to the life in the word, okay? You receive the word of life, the word of salvation, then you transition to understanding the life in the word, okay? The life in the word. And that's the place of the present ministry of this dispensation. The present truth is a preacher of the words of this life, all right? The words of this life. When you become born again, what happens when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? What happens? In the book of Acts, we had experiences where the apostles had started to see miracles, signs and wonders. Peter and the disciples are going about, they're healing the sick and casting out devils. And the story is given. You know how they used to bring the sick on the streets and they used to lay them there, that the shadow of Peter would just bypass them so they would be healed. We had experiences of great, great demonstration of power. And in Acts 5, the 17th verse, the Bible says, because of the miracles, the signs and wonders that were working with the apostles, the Bible says the high priest rose up and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. They arrested them. Why? Because they were jealous. They could not control the anointing and glory that was happening. People came from cities and places and they used to bring the sick, the palsied, the crippled, you know, and they would be healed under shadows. They would be healed in the prayers of these men. And so these uh, religious people became jealous and disturbed that uh, some Somebody was replacing their status quo, okay? And so they plot to get these men 
into prison. And the Bible says in the 19th verse, it says, but the angel of the Lord by night, the Bible says, opened the prison doors and brought these apostles forth and said, go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Receive the word of salvation, the word of life that gives us eternal life. But after that, we are supposed now to go into the level where we're teaching you the words of the life, the eternal life you've received, the life of salvation that has come to you. And now the angelics are opening prison doors to commission these men to go and teach the words of this life, okay? That yes, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you receive eternal life. But what is eternal life? What is eternal life? And the Bible says, and this is eternal life, that you or they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. To understand who God is, to understand who Jesus really is. Because if you understand who God really is and Jesus, you'll have no excuse to be healed. You will not say, oh, you know, he's healing that one, but for me, he's not going to heal me. No. The Bible says all things are possible. All things are possible to him that believeth. God has never given, Jesus has never expressed any place or any circumstance where a man has believed and he has faced impossibility. All things are possible to him that believeth. All things are possible. You just need to know how do I cultivate this thing called faith? How do I learn to believe? Okay? Because when your mind agrees with something, I always emphasize that when your mind agrees with something, some people get so convinced in their mind that because their mind agrees, therefore their spirits are connected to the life in the word. No. It takes a certain place in the spirit. And that's where I want to take you to, okay? Jesus said that the words that I speak to you, he said they are spirit and they are life. But can you connect to the life in those words? Because yes, you can admit and agree that these words are effectual in the spirit realm. But can you connect to the life in those words? How do you connect to the life in those words? I'll tell you how you connect to the words of that life, okay? Look at Jesus. Firstly, understand Jesus. Because when the Bible says in the beginning was the word, now we're defining who Christ is, right? And in him was life, and the life was the light, all right? And that's the light that shines in darkness, and darkness comprehended him not, okay? Then we transition in how that word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the Bible says, and we beheld his only glory, his own glory, as the only true son of God, full of grace and truth. The word became flesh, all right? God knew that one of the most fundamental ways for you to connect to life is if this word firstly became flesh. And when it becomes flesh, you can observe it through a man, through a life well lived, okay? The Bible says, now he has spoken to us by Christ. Because this God spirit looked for a way to express life to man, and he realized, no, I have to go in the form of the way they understand life, human life. He became a man, he humbled himself, all right? Even though he was equal to God, the Bible says, but he humbled himself. He came as a man. He came in the likeness of a servant. He comes as a man, all right? He carries the life of men. And in there, the word is wrapped. And as the word is wrapped, he's trying to give a picture, an example, for the ardent reader and lover of the word to connect the dots by observing how the word lived in the life of men. Because in there, men can now connect to what is spiritual, what is divine, and what is a way which is the life of God himself. It's expressed in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay? Study Jesus as an example. 
You know, today we tell people, what would Jesus do in this situation? What would Jesus do in this situation? That is a very inferior expression. Because for the church, the New Testament church, it is too late to say what would Jesus do. The Bible says, Paul says, we hold the very feelings and thoughts of Christ. The very feelings and thoughts of Christ. We have, the Bible says, the mind of Christ. So we cannot be the kind that are winding to know what Christ would do. We are actually the kind that are already winded in the knowledge of what Christ is doing. All right, because this is love made perfect, that you might have confidence on that day, for as he is, so are we in this world. All right, the Bible says, but now we see Jesus. We must see Jesus, study the man. Because many people who are failing in life, dying and failing to have the results of the miraculous, they have failed to study Christ. All right, and in the things you must study, firstly, study the consciousness of the God life. One of the things to study is the consciousness of the God life. All right? Look at how Jesus reacted to the circumstances around him. Consciousness to the God life. All right? The consciousness of the Christ, the way his conscience was placed, the way he lived in his conscience, should show the believer how God thinks. I'll give you an example. He curses a fig tree because he has not found fruit on it. And in one of the accounts, it did not dry immediately. Okay? And then Jesus goes on to another city and does his business. He cursed it. All right? He cursed it, but he did not die immediately. So he goes in another city and does his business. All right? Look at his consciousness. Now, the Bible says, when they come back, the Bible says in Mark 11, when they passed the next morning, as they passed by, the Bible says, they saw the fig tree dried up on the roots, all right? And the next verse says, and Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cast is withered away. And Jesus answered and said, have faith in God. In fact, the literal translation there is have the God kind of faith. Elevate yourself to the consciousness of the God life. And God is trying to tell Peter something bigger than what many people can interpret for that hour. And this is what God is saying. When I cast that fig tree, I was so sure that it withered that the next day I did not need to look at it to confirm whether the word that I spoke was so or it wasn't. That's a consciousness. Because if you read the scriptures, the disciples turned and they saw the tree had withered. Peter remembered. He says, Master, behold, why is he catching the attention of the Christ to look there? He's catching the attention of the Christ to look there because I think they've observed he has not turned an eye to see what he cast, whether it had withered. That's a consciousness. So you have pain in your body and then you put hands on you. Father, I cast out this pain. I command this swelling to disappear. And then you check and see whether that swelling is disappeared. And in my meetings, I tell people check and they check and their swellings are disappeared. But what if your swelling does not disappear? And someone says, oh, it's still there. Oh, so that means it's not healed. Let's wait for another opportunity where God will heal us or another man of God will pray for us so we get healed. I have people who have prayed for, okay, and a miracle did not take place immediately. But one, two, three, four, five days later, one week, one month, they see the results, all right? But as a one who is praying for them, I am not supposed to bear a consciousness to look back to see whether that disappeared. There are many Christians who look back in the spirit and they don't even know that they look back in the spirit. Oh, I've believed God for this amount of money. You check your bank account and that money is not there. Oh God, Father, I thank you because it's there. And then you check again and it's not there. <laughs> that money won't appear there. It will not just come. There are principles spiritually that underline God's provision. You need to know how these principles work. But you need to be awakened also to the consciousness that makes money appear. All right? Peter comes, oh, they want taxes. He tells him, go in the mouth of a fish. 
and you'll get some for you and for me and pay for taxes. Okay? Jesus would not stay praying, Oh, Father, I thank you. I pray that he's going to find the money there. It was never in the consciousness of the Christ that money was not going to be found. Okay? He says, Lazarus's sickness will not end in death. And Lazarus dies. Of course, the people who are around are like, oh my God. He actually spoke some and did not come to pass. But you don't see the Christ shaken. Oh, Martha runs to him. If you had been here four days late, my brother would not have died. Okay, look at the consciousness of God. Jesus is not rushing because he had that the man is going to die. He is the resurrection and the life. Even if he found him dead for one year or hundreds of years, he would still give life to that man. Look at the consciousness, the Godhead, right? He says, no, he shall leave. Don't worry. Jesus is not slowed. He has not come to, oh, sorry, uh, we are sorry for the loss. No, 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 no. Why have you laid him? Okay, and then he goes to the tomb, Lazarus comes forth, and Lazarus comes. Why? Because he had made the confession, he had declared in the spirit that the sickness of this man will not end in death. It does not matter whether the body has given way. The reality of that word still carries the authentic authority of the spirit to fulfill the word his consciousness has created because he has the God kind of faith. He has a certain faith in his God. It's one thing to pray for divine healing, breakthrough, financial relationships, and all these other things. You cannot walk in the miraculous when your conscience has not been elevated to the God kind of conscience. The conscience that refuses to see if it worked because it's sure it must have worked, that even if somebody looked there and it has not worked, this conscience would not look in dismay and disappointment that it has not worked or that it would not even welcome the possibility that it has not worked because somebody else looked there and they're seeing that Lazarus has died. It doesn't change the confession. It doesn't change the conviction. It doesn't change the mindset. It does not change the attitude. It just looks on and marches on triumphantly, convinced that nothing is impossible to whosoever believeth. So what if it does not work? Then you have not believed with the right consciousness. With the right consciousness. Number two, understand the life which is in God and expressed through Christ, okay? Separate the life of men and the life which is of God. The life of men has an end. It was breathed in man, all right? The life of God, it exists beyond any ability, any timing or any process. This is the life of God himself. When you receive Jesus Christ, you have obtained life eternal. But that is the very life which is of God himself. Remember, by that life, he created everything. Let's just say they're telling you that your kidneys are not working. Create new kidneys. Because the same life that created that kidney can recreate another. Oh, I wish you understood this. I wish you understood this. The life of God, okay? Because all things carry their bearing of existence through that same life. When he said, let there be, that life out of God created everything you see by the word. The Bible says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith. Can you believe that with that word, when God said, let there be, light had to be. Let animals come forth, animals had to appear. Let the land be separated from the seas, that had to take place. And now he forms man and breathes into him the breath of life. 
and that man becomes a living soul. Think about just how much life is in God enough to create and that he has transferred that life in you, in the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The Bible says he that hath the Son hath life in him. He that hath the Son. This is the record. That if you have the Son, the Bible says you have the life of God. So when you're praying for the sick person, do you imagine that Jesus is going to come from heaven and then come and then sit on that person and heal them? Or are you releasing the life of God that is within your spirit on that sick person? Because when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, in him is life. And he that hath the Son hath life. And he that has not the Son hath not life. So now you have received the life of God. It's in your spirit. The very life that God used. That's why when Jesus is talking about your faith, he says, if you believe, you shall speak to a mountain. Now, when you say mountain, some people just say, oh, figuratively, mountain flew. <laughs> figuratively, mountain, you know, uh, gray hair, turned to black. No, th those are things even people can do. They can dye hair. No, when he says you shall speak to this mountain, he means you can literally speak to a mountain, even a physical one, and tell it, be ye removed and be thrown in yonder place. And the Bible says, and it shall be so, if you do not doubt in your heart. The thought that a believer has the power to move mountains, to displace tectonic plates, to speak to the weather, to speak to devils, all right? Now you have heard in the world we have a pandemic, all right? And that word pandemic comes from a word called pandemonium, pandemonium, all right? Legions of devils, legions of demons. They've been released in the earth. And because they're released in the earth, people are sick. The world is sick. People are dying every day. But all sickness is demonic, pandemonic. Um, it's demonic, all right? Now, if you have the life of God, how can you catch sickness in the first place? How can cancer come in your body? How? How? I remember years ago, I go to a doctor and I'm wheezing and I can't breathe and they take me in the hospitals at night. I can't breathe. My lungs are clogged. I'm like, I'm sinking. You know, I can't breathe. And this doctor looks at me in the eyes and tells me, you have uh, asthma, okay? You have asthma. And uh, it developed so fast that I remember the day the doctor writes on a piece of paper that you now need an inhaler. You cannot walk, leave without an inhaler. He writes that prescription. I remember that day. He told me every time you feel like the lungs are clogging, you put an inhaler on your mouth. I remember that day. And I took that paper and I went back home and I looked at that paper intently. And I went on my knees because it's been long. I was sick. I was sick. It had bothered me for quite some time. And now I'm at the place where injections can't help. I need an inhaler 24 7. I need to walk with one. And I remember I went on my knees and I prayed. And as I was praying, I get this encounter. A light comes back through, and God takes me back to Genesis, okay? And in the simplest reality of this light hitting Genesis, and God starts to tell me, remember what I said, that in everything that I created, I said, and it was good. And it was good. And it was good. The air that I created was good. Everything that I made was good. And then God asks me a question. He said, what did the doctor say you're allergic to? And I remember very well the doctor told me that I was allergic to cold air. Cold air. And God said, is that what I created to be good? I said, yes. So if I created that to be good, how come you 
are allergic to what I made good? Is it in my nature as God to create something that will change against you, yet I made it good and I knew that you would live in this earth? I gave earth to you and I created you to live in the world. Would I be God to put a different, you know, breath, a different air, or to set air against you? The light just lit. Immediately the light went on. Boom! The encounter happened. And I said, I cannot have asthma. And I remember I got that paper and I tore it and I laughed and I laughed and I laughed and I clapped my hands and I laughed because I was thinking, oh my God, the devil had tricked me all this while to believe that cold air is my enemy. Something God made to be good. I laughed and I laughed and I laughed and I laughed and I laughed. I have never wheezed ever since that day. It's perhaps more than 15 years now. I have never wheezed. I've never had any issues with my lungs ever again. I never needed medication another day. I never needed any hell another day. But I remember the times they had to pick me at night, 2, 3 a.m., driving me to hospital because I can't breathe. And see how the miracle happened. Because I connected to the life in the Word that nothing God has created was bad for me. That's all you need. This is a health example, but that's what cuts across financially, relationship-wise, career-wise, and every other aspect of life. I can tell you after that health upon health, of course, I had many issues. I struggled with many issues, heart disease, and many things. But all of those things now, I look back, and I'm 100% normal from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet because I connected to the life which is in the world. I connected to that life. I understood the life of God. I understood the life that created oxygen. And that life could not set itself against my lungs to breathe. All right? It could not set itself against my lungs to breathe. And now that I am born of God and I'm born again, I now have the life of God himself. That is something I speak over and over and over my life myself. Every day I tell myself that I have the life of God. Sometimes I phone people and I'm shaking their hands and they're passing out and they're getting slain by the power of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes I encounter people and demons start manifesting on them. All right? That life, it's in my spirit. I've gotten into places and the presence of God has come in such a way that I find myself favored and, and I find things aligning for me because there's something about me. And you who is watching me, if you're a believer, it's called the life which is of God. It's in you. It's in you. It's in you. But lastly, study the word to know what God said and what he did not say, what he really said and what he did not say, or what men said versus what God said. Because there are many people who use the Bible, and they're quoting scriptures, certain men in the Bible said, but they are not what exactly God said. Not all the words spoken in the Bible are God's inspirational word. Some people say that the Bible is the inspirational word of God. But what in there is actually inspirational of God? Is everything in there inspirational of God? Or inspired by God? For your learning, yes. But for your living and experience, not everything in the word was inspired by God because in there, there are even experiences God shows the weaknesses of certain individuals. So we can say, holistically, it is inspired by God if we can learn what he was teaching in there. But not everybody who has the Bible understands what God teaches. Okay? It's only the inspired word of God to the man who is elevated in epignosis and carries the full and complete precise knowledge of God to know exactly what in the Bible was God inspiring or teaching or commanding. But not everybody who reads the Bible understands it. Okay? 
Not everybody who reads the Bible understands it. Some of us read the stories of men in the Old Testament who did things that were not inspired by God or the inspiration of God, who say things that were not inspired by God or the inspiration of God. And God expects that through learning, okay? The Bible says these things are written for your learning, for your learning, that through comfort and patience you might obtain hope, okay? So some people can't separate what these men uh, said versus what God is saying, okay? So you read Job, the Lord giveth and he taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is Job concluding on what he thinks God has done. All right? But when you read the scriptures very keenly, you realize that Job took the hedge off him. Now, there are people who are watching me who will not agree because I have not taken time to actually open and explain, you know, the holistic picture. But if you are a reader, go and look for my sermon on Job. I have a sermon on Job. It will explain to you that God is not the one who brought these things on Job, but rather Job had opened a hedge by the spirit of fear. And he says, and the things that I greatly feared have come upon me. In fact, the Amplified says, the things which I fear, or I greatly feared, they have come upon me. He says, I am not at ease, no have I rest. I am not quiet, okay? And then troubles befalls me. Why does trouble befall him? Because he had a spirit of fear, okay? He always lived in a constant fear that his children one day will die. His faith was directed to the death of his children. And so Satan had legal right to take what this man's age had opened for him. In fact, God tells Satan, see, there is no age on him. Just told Satan, there is no age on him. Just don't kill him. But there is no age on him. I think Satan was so convinced, okay, of Job having a age that even when it was off, Satan had not the full reality and understanding of it because Satan does know everything that happens in the spirit. Okay? But this was a man who never lived in safety. He was always in fear. And the thing he greatly feared came upon him. You see, again, there was a consciousness. He was consciousness of the death of his children. And the Bible says, neither was I quiet. So I think he used to sit in conversation and says, you know, I imagine when all my children are dying. I imagine when I've lost everything. Oh my God. So that consciousness, that was a door for Satan to come in and afflict him. To come in and afflict him. He had fear in his heart. Okay? But you cannot say that the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Oh, but the Bible says that giftings and callings of God are without repentance. How come he does not take away his gifts? How come he does not take away his calling? All right? But the people who teach, God will take away that gift from you if you play with him. God will take away that calling from you. No, he can take the assignment, but not the gifting and calling. There are things that God cannot take away. You cannot now quote God like Job that God gave and he took away. No, the giftings and callings of God are without repentance. Whether you misuse it or not, he has given. He's not short as of to take away because probably he will still need to give it to that one. No, they're not numbered. He's eternal. He's bottomless. He's infinite in supply. You see? So, but it takes a certain understanding to know what is God actually inspiring in the word versus the people, the elements in scripture that are doing whatever they are doing. Some of these men were men of weakness. Okay? They were men of weakness. And we see God's hand trying to sustain and uphold their weakness. But some people go in the weakness and in the weak parts of these men and pick scriptures there and start to use them. They will not work. You must know exactly what did God really say. What did God really say? It's like I was one time in a certain nation, Malaysia, and I, I was preaching in a, in a certain place called uh, Miri, right? And uh, I was meeting a group of intercessors and ministers and elders and I was sharing. And uh, a question comes up in the conversation touching how do we win, you know, souls? How do we win souls? And I had found that these guys were gathering to pray for the salvation of Malaysia, to pray for the salvation of their people. And I said, okay, but what did God say? Did God really say that you should pray for your relatives, your people in the nation to get born again? Or you think that that's what God said and therefore you have drawn inspiration over that. What does the Bible say? I gave them a simple teaching. The Bible says that the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. 
The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And he says, and now pray to the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. He did not say, pray to the Lord of the harvest that you will have a harvest. Every person in the world, the Bible says the propitiation of our sins, not only for us, but for the world, okay? The whole world. That means God looks at every person, every non-believer as a harvest, not a planting. Right? When we're talking about harvest, we mean he has already done the planting, he has watered, they are ready. The Bible says, lift your head, you'll see that the fields are white. But some people's heads are not lifted to see divine inspiration. They look at the weaknesses and realities of men's words and they call all that inspiration. Okay? So I told them, do not pray, God save Malaysia. God sent people to save our people, our nation. I told them, pray to the God of the harvest, that he might send forth laborers in his harvest. The harvest is his, he owned it. He says those people, even though they are not born again, they are still mine and I did all the work that is necessary. I did not send you to go pray that I might save them. I already did that, okay? Jesus was sent for their salvation. I asked you to pray for laborers to go in the harvest. So I told him that's the right way to pray. Pray to God that you'll send laborers. It means that for every unborn again soul, there's an equal laborer that matches even the hardest heart in the world to receive God. Just pray for the right laborer to go to the harvest. You will see more salvation. You see, now, what had God really said versus what were the people thinking to pray like, right? It's inspirational, which is divine inspiration and which is human inspired, okay? What did God really say about your health? What did God really say about your finances? What did God really say about your ministry, pastor? What did God really say? And whatever he said, is it sufficient? If it is sufficient, which I believe he is, then elevate yourself to that consciousness. Apply your life within the life which is of God in you to that consciousness, to that word. You'll start to see that the miraculous will not only be evident on your life, but it will be a regular experience. Miracles will not be mysterious. There will be a regular. That's why Fenero, for example, for us, miracles are a regular thing. It's not that we don't celebrate what God does. It's just that we've seen it. We're convinced of it. We expect it every second. I expect that every time I switch on these cameras to preach, somebody will get healed. Somebody will get a breakthrough. Somebody will get a miracle. Somebody will get a financial deliverance. Somebody will be relieved and released of something. Somebody will be changed and transformed. Even tonight, somebody's life has been changed. Father, I thank you. Because your word has gone out, the seed has been planted, now the results, the answers of those prayers. Whoever is listening in right now, I want you to just open your mouth with thanksgiving concerning anything you've believed God for. I want you to just thank for it now. If you have cancer, tell God, I thank you because I no longer have cancer. If you are struggling financially, tell him, God, I thank you because my financial troubles are over. My debts are paid. Breakthroughs are come. I want you to start confessing everything which is in you, which is in Christ with thanksgiving. And as you open your mouth, I see God healing. I see God breaking through for you. I see God delivering. I see God answering. I see kidneys heal in the name of Jesus. I see heart disease heal right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you. You're settling people in marriage. I thank you because you're healing somebody's child. They receive their healing. I bless you. I bless you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. It is done. It is so done. It is so done, hallelujah. And if you're there and you've never given your life to Christ, I want to give you a grand opportunity to receive eternal life. The Bible says there's no name by which men are saved. Under earth or anywhere, 
serve the name of Jesus Christ. I want to give you an opportunity to receive him now as your Lord and Savior. Repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for your death. I thank you for loving me. And now, with my heart, I believe. And with my mouth, I confess that you died and rose again for me. And tonight, I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm born again. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.